It's winter time. It's cold time. Tom, you were sharing with me some kind of a camping experience that you had when, were you a scout? Tell I me about a, it. I was a Boy Scout every February in Ohio. What part so of Ohio? Near Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, a town called Illyria is where I'm from. It sounds it sounds rural. I say it with respect. I'm wearing bib overalls as a way of life. Nobody respects outdoors as much as I do. Are you describing a primarily outdoors place? My hometown was not, but you go in any direction about 15 minutes and you're in cornfields and trees and that sort of thing. So very near all the type of rural that you're talking about. And at what age were you encouraged to go experience the great outdoors? From a very young age, I, my dad was an outdoorsman, so I was always camping. Boy Scouts, though, started, I think, around... 10 or 11. Yeah, that's like that. the average age. Yeah. And what you were telling me about camping in the snow, which has its own unique value and its own unique terrors and its own unique great stories. Please share with yeah. us. So in February, the scout camp would put on a camp called Camp Alaska and you would go out camping on a Friday and you would build your own shelter and you would have to cook your own food without using any sort of pots and pans. So we would do things like... What kind of food would you cook without using pots and pans? We would make stew inside of a pumpkin, and we would put the pumpkin in the ground and put coals all around it and cook the stew inside the pumpkin and then eat it out of the pumpkin. Would you eat the pumpkin? We would then eat the pumpkin as well. Did you have dogs with you at this time? Did dogs go camping with you? Because camping with dogs, again, has its own ups and downs and sideways. I've been camping with dogs. I have not, well, I've grilled and chilled and whatever, but we always brought along the pots and the pans and the, you know, uh, the sure. amenities. But things like when you camp with dogs, for example, it's always freezing ass. Outdoor snow camping is brilliant, right? Yeah. And uh, as you're preparing dinner, you put the dogs in the tent and every four minutes you go kick the sides of the tent so the dogs run around and around their little dog bodies warm it up. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> I've never heard of that. Yes. <laughs> it's a kind of organic heating. <laughs> I like it. I do like it. Uh, now, if you're doing a long kayak trip, the dog is eating exactly what you're eating, which with right. me was brown beans and fish. So while they're also heating the interior, but let's stay focused, Tom. <laughs> there you go. Okay. You, you So you're cooking dinner in a pumpkin, and then you eat the pumpkin. So you go hiking and camping, fishing? Or? No, the, the whole camp is based on you go out and you take certain, you can allowed to take certain things like tarps, but you have to build your own shelter. So the only reason we would take tarps is because there's always the possibility of precipitation, rain, snow, that sort of thing. We called tarps and things like that snivel gear. Hmm. The I've more miserable, ah. the more pneumonia you had at the end of these trips in the Boy Scouts, the more terrorized, dripping, and, and the worse your story was, the more studly you were. <laughs> yeah. You didn't try it. You yeah. intentionally wear a t-shirt and shorts and claim everything else is snivel gear. Yeah. You Eskimos and your snivel gear. <laughs> That's what makes the Marines great. But continue, Tom. <laughs> What kind of clothes were you wearing back then? Because we wore old Korean War issue canvas, like Carhartt. Yeah. The old Korean War issue of uh, heavy-duty canvas, waxed canvas or oiled canvas is now popular again. Carhartt everything. Sure. I even see that there's a warm jacket for the dog. Right. A Carhartt jacket for yeah. the dog that I've looks exactly it. like my bib overalls. But when you, what year were you a Boy Scout in? What was on the radio when you were a, 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 an Eagle Scout or a Boy Scout? Uh, this, was, this was like early, early 90s, like 1990, 91, 92. And were you allowed to take music with you when you went camping? We always, I, I, you know, I had a Walkman, so I had a couple cassette tapes and stuff like that. I was, I was very into grunge when it was happening, like early 90s, so it was always some sort of grunge cassette. That tape, I, I remember all of those things that I all, all we had was um, I had a little cassette player, mm -hmm. okay, and it was it what didn't have enough gas to be any louder than the Petro Max fuel lantern. If this in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, if you went camping, and I'm sure all your camp masters and instructors who are actually probably my age <laughs> will remember that the, the hiss you had to pump it to give it pressure and it'll go. And it was so loud that it would just bury the music. 
Yeah. All we would do, all the only entertainment that we had that we would bring, depending on where we would go camping or climbing. Because if it was, for example, Himalayas, then you're going to have very different stomach problems than when you're camping in New Guinea. In New Guinea, you're going to need, if you used two paperbacks in the Himalayas, it's because you never pissed or shit, and you had high-altitude pulmonary or cerebral edema, so you never slept, and the only thing you could do to get over the noise of that Petromax lantern was to read out loud to each other. Mm. And you would tear off pieces of the paperback, so when you became depressed and you know suicidal after four days in the tent... <laughs> that you would be able to share the pieces of the paperback and instead of television or actual, you know, Netflix or anything like that. You take turns reading from the book that you brought. And uh, back in then, it was James Clavell. It would have been Tom Clancy or somebody jumping ahead. But, for example, when we got lost in New Guinea, I had to read... Uh, no, no. It, yeah, in New Guinea, I read Shogun because it was one of the thickest books you could get. You want to start the book two weeks early, so you have plenty of pages, so you can tear that off and give it to one of your your, your buddies or the, your girlfriend or whoever, and then you want to start, so you have at least two or three sections in advance because you're all going to get diarrhea, and you're going to end up wiping your ass with the book. <laughs> page by page. Right. All dummies, no, don't bring toilet paper. Three shots of water, it's done, you're fucked. Mm, right. <laughs> you, oh, you tried to dry toilet paper out <laughs> in the sun. No, all you could do Impossible. was- Yeah, all you could do is pull the uh, cardboard tube out and use it as a bong, which I did not learn in the Boy Scouts. Roth Show. But back to you, Tom. You still go camping. You're still outdoors. I do. I routinely, do. where were you at last time? Where, where last, was the last, last trip time, that you had? Last trip was last year, um, last fall. I went on a, we did 19 miles out- was not supposed to be 19 miles, but it ended up being 19 miles Let's out. Let's just start with that. All great journeys have destinations which the traveler cannot expect. That's almost what you signed up for, right. but you didn't know it, but you did. Right. Uh, so all of these unforeseen and unpredicted destinations contained within, like a riddle within a cipher. <laughs> Where did this happen to or for you? <laughs> it was uh, we, Mammoth, up near Mammoth. We oh, were, sure. And we were supposed to leave from Devil's Post Pile, which is a very famous spot in Mammoth. But because it had snowed the weekend before, the road was closed. So we had to go to, I don't remember, I think it was the, Duck Lake or okay, something. Okay, hold on. Duck Lake, I understand. But yeah. the Devil's Post Pile, we had a place out in Joshua Tree that it got so fucking hot and miserable in the summer, we called it the Devil's Onion Ring. It's not the same thing, right? Not the same thing. Not at all the same thing. Close. <laughs> oh, oh! <laughs> An I, 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 uh, what do you call it? Anatomical joke. Yeah, <laughs> outstanding. Yeah. So yeah, so Devil's Post Pile was supposed to be our starting spot. Went to Duck Lake instead, which added, I believe, seven miles. And this is seven trip. miles on incline. Are you on trail and you're moving up on, and down on and trail, all around? on trail and uh, incline and decline? Because um, we hiked first up. And then we had to hike down into a canyon. And then we were going to a place called the Iva Bell Hot Springs. And that was up on the side of a very steep hill. And I don't know how familiar you are with like uh, I know hot, hot springs. springs, sure. Yeah. So there's grasses and slick, muddy areas all around up there. And by the time we got there, it was dark. We didn't know where we were going. We just knew that we were going up that hill. And, and, it, and, and it got it got tough. Okay. The and did you and the, are the hot springs hot enough that you can get in them in the snow? Yes. Yes, absolutely. We did hot springs like that in the Himalayas. Mm. I'm like 20 summers and a thousand years ahead of you, Tom. Right. <laughs> and when, and I and starting off, I call what I my style is camp for. Very, very basic. It's bib overalls. It's uh, a sleeping bag in the back of somebody else's pick, pickup truck. I never bought anything better than a bathing suit, a pair of hiking shoes, or a dog. And if you put all three together, you can pretty much find your way and fall in love with somebody. Somewhere interesting, barely pronounceable. Either her last name or where she's from. <laughs> Write the story, be the story. And 
as it becomes winter now, I am compelled to think of the winter snow experiences because my mom always would send me and my sisters out to play in the snow just for a peace of mind and quiet. And we'd go, well, why are we playing in the snow? It's freezing. And she'd say, pretend you're Eskimos. And I still am. Went to the Himalayas for the first time when I was about 40 years old. Let me read from the book. There actually is a place called Kathmandu, and it's in Nepal, which is where all the giant mountains are. And you got to fly to the other side of the world. I flew on my own from L.A. to Tokyo, and then from Tokyo to Bangkok. And you spend the night in Bangkok, and then you go to Kathmandu. You get together there and you provision up the rest of the food and so forth, and you get the climbing permits. You have to pay for the permits to go onto the mountain, so at least there's a record of your last name if you don't come back. It's sort of like wearing a helmet and a life vest when you surf 40 footers. That's so they can identify the body later when the helicopter pulls you out of the drink. It will not save your life. Kathmandu hasn't changed since the 12th century, except now every fourth street corner has got a guy with no socks and a knockoff Armani t-shirt with a jacket with the sleeves pushed up going, hey, dude, got some cash, dude. Cash or hash? Yes, both, black market. The rest of them are fellas walking around in the traditional loincloth in their version of dreadlocks, and it's like going back in time. From there, you find a lukla which is at the base of the Kumbu Valley, a huge vista that contains the mountains you've never been looking at in school books but can't remember how to spell the names. Amadablam, Lotse, Lotse Shar, Nupse, Everest. Everest was about a day, two days slow, easy walk across the valley from the mountain where we were working. You work your way up that valley before you get to the mountain, and then you're going to climb. But the adventure starts in Lukla. You go to the little airport in Kathmandu, and we waited in the airport for five days because the government only has so many aircraft. I think it was two Puma, heli- two Puma helicopters and two Twin Otter propeller planes, both of which were still on the wire, which means there's a wire from the front in the cockpit back to uh, where the wings are that moves the panels in the back and the ailerons. Today, it's all digital. It's all uh, hydraulic, okay? Like the back of a low rider. Mm-mm. In New Guinea, I remember watching the co-pilot crawl across all of the cargo. We had a whole bunch of, about 1,500 pounds of cargo under a big manila rope net. And he had to crawl with about 18 inches of space between him and the roof of the airplane as we're flying over the mountains and squeeze into the back and yank on a wire. And I asked the pilot, what is he doing? And he smiled and said, he's steering. But the adventure starts in Lukla. You go to the little airport in Kathmandu, and we waited there for five days because, I'm sorry, the plane is being used by the government because there has been another flood. It's like, okay, finally shows up, and you fly into Lukla, which is perched on the side of the mountain. It's a tiny village, and every every house there is made of wooden boards, slats, candle-lit lanterns, and little dirt trails in between. And you head up this dirt trail that's two feet wide with an 1,100 foot drop off. Okay. That's big air in the United States, but not in the Himalayas. You know, uh, Empire State Building, for example, is 1,100 feet tall. Not unusual to look over the edge of one of the cliffs up there and you're 20 Empire State Buildings up straight up and down. Wow. And it's called ridge walking where if you fall off one side, the only thing your buddies can do is throw themselves on the other side so you saddle the ridge and stabilize each other and then crawl up, make your way back up. That happened to me twice. Wow. All right? Um, But that's the challenge. Can't find out what you're made of until you actually make that final showdown. Can you keep it together? That's what you sometimes call it. I call it holding your mud. (laughs) It's a little more, once again, anatomical. I'm the son of a doctor. I can hold my mud. How do I know? I tested. <laughs> I was so scared I didn't shit for, I think, nine days. <laughs> you head up this dirt trail, and as you go into the valley and back in time, you've got to realize that all these wooden huts that you see, the lantern in that hut, all of the rugs, whatever, were carried up there on somebody else's back. 
This is a kind of hamlet where you get up to 15,000 feet and it's the last high point of real civilization. Shangri-La. You've heard of Shangri-La. That's James Hilton's famous book, uh, Lost Horizon, which is turned into many movies and what is it called? Shangri-La. But that actually exists. It is the last point of a civilized village. These are yak buffaloes wandering through the streets and all kinds of livestock, sheep, cattle, etc. And the Namche Bazaar hasn't changed since probably the 1100s. It's called Namche. The Namche Bazaar is very famous. It's what Shangri-La is based on from James Hilton's Lost Horizon. And you can see all the miles, all the mountains, all the way around. And there's nothing like it on Earth. There's a generator, they have some electricity, but keep in mind that every pole that the wire is running on for the electricity to the generator was carried up out of Kathmandu. And from Kathmandu to Lukla on foot, four weeks. When Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, the first guys to summit Everest in 1954, did a siege tactic, I think they had 150 Sherpa and Sherpani and uh, close to 400 uh, water buffalo Okay, yaks, uh, and it took them seven weeks to get from Kathmandu to the base of Everest because there wasn't no little carved out airstrip. And when we talk about the Lukla airstrip, average jet range by law in the United States for a jet to land, even a small one, is I think 5,200 feet. If you land on a short jet strip like St. Bart's Island, you have to have a special clearance for short takeoff and landing in a jet or a turboprop, and that's 2,200 feet long. It's terrifying to the pilot and to the passenger who's never experienced that before on a turboprop aircraft. As I recollect, and I'm pretty good with this because I held a pilot's license for, for a while, um, in Lukla, the dirt airstrip that we landed on was 750 feet. Wow. And when you take off, it's on a 62-degree angle sloping down, which is like expert ski slope, to give you extra momentum. And you see dirt, 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 20,000 feet down. Wow. It's breathtaking. Roth show. The second time that I had come out of Lukla to go, I caught a ride on one of the first aid Pumas from the military and I helped the guy use chewing gum to patch up an oil leak up in the rotor bearing <laughs> before we took off. That's what you're dealing with here, Sarosky. I like it. <laughs> We've been making references to Kanye West, who is inarguably a multimillionaire, if not a billionaire, and to many of us, and to many of the initiated and engaged or uninitiated and unilluminated, he lives in Shangri-La. The Kardashians are occupants, permanent dwellers of Shangri-La. I have been to the real Shangri-La, and it's called Nam Che. It's at 15,000 feet, as far as you can possibly imagine. Hiking to Nam Che from Lukla took us two weeks. Sleeping beside the trail, all right? And in Nam Che, when we got there, there's this fella and he has a little tea house. He built the tea house himself. It's just a construct of plywood and two by fours and four by fours, and it has two floors. And it's pitched into the side of the mountain overlooking a village that, again, hasn't changed in a thousand years. And it's very simple. It's like something out of Lonesome Dove a little cot that you can rent for a few bucks. A shower downstairs. And the shower is a wooden box about the size of a telephone booth. He boils up about 10, 15 gallons of melted snow water and then lets you know when it's all ready. He drags it upstairs with the help of his two young teenage sons in old, old wooden handmade buckets, okay? And you go down into that little handmade wooden shower telephone booth stall, and you take off all your clothes for the first time. For me, it was in two and a half weeks. We're out camping. I have an alpine haircut, which is cone head shaped just like the hat, okay? And it's fucking cold, but you're all written. You, you're in National Geographic. It's way zero. That's what we call it. And the wind blows and it's dry and you're dehydrated and you've got altitude sickness. And there's a rope and you pull the rope and it's got a bucket that sits on the end of a pipe over your head with holes punched in the bottom. 
You getting this? This is right out of the Beverly Hillbillies, but when they actually lived in the Appalachia. And even though the water's boiling, that wooden pipe is so cold that by the time it travels five feet out of the top floor above your head, comes out of the bucket through the little holes, it's just right for the first time in two and a half weeks of working your way up these little wicked witch trails. And it was the first shower that any of us had taken. And that's some Nam Che Shangri-La fucking high tech. I don't know if you can get that in Beverly Hills. And he had a little bit of solar power going on up there from some panels that a Japanese climbing expedition had left behind. And he had a little microwave oven brought up out of Kathmandu and something that was shipped through India or Thailand. And it was his most prized possession. This was kept in a wooden boarded room where everything was cooked on a stove that was stoked with wood fire. Think cowboy, big iron stove that you keep throwing wood and kindling into and everything that they ate and that we ate for a couple days rest was cooked on top of this stove or baked right in the fire. Everything except popcorn. Popcorn you can transport very easily. Corn kernels do really well in cold weather and they last forever. And the only thing that he cooked in the microwave was the popcorn. Because up there, everybody's got nine children. That's that's your only insurance against the cold when you get old, right? And all the kids would gather around, and there were five of us in our climbing expedition, and we gathered around, and he put a bowl with some popcorn in the bottom, and then he put a little bit of cooking oil or yak yak butter, I think it was, all right? And he didn't put a top on the bowl. And he closed the door to the microwave and hit send, And it started popping all over the inside of the microwave and we all squealed with laughter. (laughs) Like we were taught, like we were watching a Chaplin comedy. It was the greatest thing. And when, when we opened the door to the microwave, it spilled everywhere. And everybody, (laughs) we couldn't wait to shovel in another load and watch it go crazy again. It's the only thing he cooked in the microwave. It had a purpose. I'll see you next weekend. Roth Show. There's three drinks, too, up in the Himalayas. First and most popular, it's called Chang, and it's made out of yak milk, very carefully diluted and then left to ferment. It's really some kind of a dishwater taste, and it smells rank. And you can smell when somebody's been drinking Chang from 12 meters away. It's really strong, like wine, and a lot of people up in the high mountains start drinking it right at breakfast. It seriously takes the cold off. Second is Tomba. Tumba is fermented millet. It's grain. And if you just let it sit, it'll start to create its own heat. So what you do is you put it in open jars and you wrap the jars in towels and then you stick the towels in the bottom of a sleeping bag and let that sit for about three weeks to a couple of months. It also has its own given aroma. Uh, oh, day woolen sock. <laughs> Is, is the uh, fragrance, and it starts to smell real rich and sour. And all of your Sherpas, the guys working on the rope teams and the stuff, their sleeping bags smell like Tomba for life. Sometimes you exchange gear. Here, uh, why don't you take my sleeping bag, give me yours. His, you will now smell like Tomba every time you use it, whether you're at the Devil's Post Pile or uh, somewhere at Everest Base. And it's the one reusable booze I've ever seen because tumba is literally sopping grain. You fill a cup up with it. You pour boiling water into the cup. You let it sit for a minute. And then with a straw, suck out all of the liquid. You could refill that cup four or five times. And the longer you let it sit, the more alcohol you'll get it. It's alcohol. Throw away the grain, feed it to the yaks. They're delighted. And you start all over. See you next weekend. And the third most popular drink is tea, chaya. They buy big, big bricks of Chinese and Tibetan tea. And it's when we started in uh, Kathmandu provisioning, we made two great stops. We stopped at the Yak Ranch. Yaks are giant, hairy buffalo. Just think like American buffalo, but with my early haircut from the 80s. <laughs> They're supreme at high altitudes. You can take them up to 25,000 feet and they're still frolicking and having a great time. They do better and better. The colder it is, it's like a sled dog. 20 degrees is too is too hot for a husky to run at. 20 below, 
they're happy. And the yaks start getting what we call yakshin. They start bumping into each other and snorting and shitting and pissing and having a great time. It's like the youth club dance. <laughs> and, uh, but that doesn't start till 20 below. <laughs> and there are yak ranches, of course, because yaks are used for everything, not just beast of burden. And we stopped and bought a couple of big, they look like cheese wheels of yak butter. It's really salty. And that goes into the tea. You melt the butter in the tea so you get a lot of fat. That's what keeps you going. That's what keeps you running. And the fellas up there, not unusual to drink 15 or 20 cups of black Chinese tea with yak butter melted into it. And how many times did I wake up in the middle of the night, I don't know, 15, 20,000 feet freezing inside five layers of clothes in a heavy thermal sleeping bag because I just used up all my fuel. I'm skinny and rank as it is. The only thing you could do was reach for some of that tea, get it going over that Petromax, cook it one cup at a time. Man, I watched some of the fellas I was climbing with break an American stick of butter in half, melt the whole half the stick into one cup and drink it down to stop from becoming hypothermic. Wow. How many nights did we have to sit out a four-day storm reading half-torn paperbacks to each other and staying awake on Chinese black tea smelling like yak butter <laughs> and drunk on Tumba? Refill me, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and after about four cups of it, you just keep refilling it, let it sit. Builds up the alcohol. You like it like light beer level, let it sit for one minute. You like it vodka level, just play a song on the radio. By the end of the song, you have a cup of vodka. And about four fill, refills later, you just slush it out and the yaks eat it. They love it. Roth Show.